welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from IDBN, and a fellow forever GM, and, and now homebrewing with the assorted notes from the Unearthly Archive, the one and only Stephen Buchel. How you doing, Bur or Bur Doing well! <laughs> I screwed it up. I screwed <laughs> up the last name. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yep. Thank you. For, thank you for coming on. So... I'll start with the humble beginnings, as I often do. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, okay, so, uh, odd introduction here. Uh, role-playing games, uh, as a game itself, was uh, college... Um, first game uh, at a board gaming club of uh, Cyberpunk 2020. Uh, that being said, I had been doing role-playing stuff for a lot longer, uh, starting off in middle school, uh, doing online um, uh, role-play by post for Nation States, uh, which was an old uh, text-based, quote-unquote, game where you pretended to be a, uh, a nation state, uh, and there was off-site uh, forms uh, for more developed role-play uh, to play as, like... Uh, the government and the um, uh, ministers and um, envoys. Um, and that's where I got started. Uh, but I've been <laughs> telling myself stories since as long as I can remember. Uh, so when I saw that there were going to be open games at the uh, college tabletop uh, gaming club, I said, yeah, I'd like to play that. And I sat down and played um, one game of Cyberpunk 2020 and then a couple weeks later, there were uh, Games of Fate. And I was like, I really enjoy this. And then several months went by and there weren't more games. So I'm like, well, I guess if it's going to happen, I'm going to have to do it myself. Uh, so I and a bunch of friends, uh, I collected a bunch of friends and I've been playing role play games with them uh, ever since that. Um Got into Dungeons and Dragons later than that. I want to say somewhere around 2018, another friend was like, hey, I'd like to get together a D&D group. So I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd play. And we played that for about four months. And then that game kind of trailed off. And I was like, well, if we're going to keep doing this, I guess I'll be the GM. Um, and been playing with that group ever since there, too. So I have like two or three home games that I'll play in any given week. Hmm. I can, I can certainly get that. <laughs> so, so now obviously assorted notes from the unearthly archive, which I'm, ju mm -hmm. I'm just going to call assorted notes fr from here on because I am not paid by the syllable. Uh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> you open, you open it up in a, in a peculiar way on the Kickstarter, and I was curious what the mindset was with this with this opening um, paragraph, which I'm I'm going to I'm going to read off. Quote: Please do. It's like when you were a kid in the back seat of the minivan driving home from the store, reading the manual for the JRPG you just bought. The characters are mysterious. The world is exciting, and the game will be amazing. You just need to start playing. That is an interesting way to set to to set up this packet. So I was curious <laughs> where where the mindset was that that was how you're going to frame it. Okay, yeah. So I've had an interesting relationship with video games throughout my life. Um, I haven't played a lot of video games. Mostly it's been uh, the video games that I have played have been Pokemon. Um, that being said, I've always been like adjacent and fascinated uh, with video games and uh, JRPGs in particular. Um, Occasionally, I, uh, at a babysitter, uh, would play a lot of JRPGs. Uh, but the other thing that they had were, like, the strategy guides or the, like, user manuals uh, that were always um, really fascinating little pieces of artifacts uh, for me. Um, and so I would sit there and read those 
and like more imagine playing the game than actually playing any of the games. Um, and of all like genres of uh, games, uh, JRPGs have always like stuck in my mind as being things that are memorable. Uh, one, because they tell like the sort of like epic stories that we, that are not or had not been common in uh, the zeitgeist of modern media experience, probably up until uh, the rise of streaming, wherein epic, truly epic stories weren't really uh, commercially uh, viable. Um, but like in JRPGs, you would get those like, all right, this is a game that it takes 400 hours to play through. Uh, and there's this, huge arc of um, epic character growth of really interesting characters uh, that you find multiple layers to. Um, and then since I didn't play through most of those stories, um, what comes to me is always that sense of anticipation uh, of reading through that uh, document and imagining all the ways that a game could go. Um, which to me is a lot the same uh, sort of experience of sitting down at the beginning of a um, campaign of a tabletop role-playing game, of sitting there building your character and imagining all the potential uh, that the story has. And for me, I think that like character option books are exactly that sort of thing. Like You want to pack as much potential and um, possibility within those uh, mechanics and descriptions and lines of flavor text um, to make them interesting and uh, evocative artifacts. Um, so that's sort of been the touchstone that I've been working on for uh, this small packet that I want to be full of potential. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. <laughs> Now, with that in, with that in mind, would it be would it be fair to say that you that when it came to the visual, des I can certainly see that manual approach with the visual design in the preview that you had um, sent me. Mm -hmm. And with and with that, go and going further with that, I I want to try and I want to get a feel for the two. Oh, subclasses that you have with that you have within the book. Yeah, sure. So, the first one, to, the first one to go into is the gun mage. This is obviously a wizard <laughs> arcane tradition. Mm -hmm. So, what sort of play style it is that can we bring to the table? Uh, so, the gun mage uh, is. When I approach uh, wizard uh, design for wizard subclasses, I often ask myself, okay, what is the unique relationship that this um, uh, character has with the sorts of magic uh, they wield? Um, and for me, um, some like touchstones for this uh, were like the Lone Ranger, um, an anime called uh, Coffin Princess Chika, and an old. Um, mm, late aughts uh, short-lived uh, primetime television um, show called Special Unit 2. Uh, and these are all like gunslingers who do interesting things uh, with their uh, bullets and weapons. Uh, so the Gun Mage is all about that sort of thing, of condensing your magic into uh, long-range single-target uh, effects. Uh, so you're imbuing silver or gold bullets and then firing them out of a uh, uh, arcane firearm that is unique to you uh, for uh, extending your reach uh, so that you can um, live every wizard's uh, true dream, which is to be as far from the things trying to hurt you as possible. Mm -hmm. um, or in later uh, levels, you get the ability to... Um, exchange uh, saving throws for attack rolls so that it is well and truly your aim and skill uh, that is the deciding factor and not um, your target's uh, resilience or um, reflexes. Um, and then, of course, like narrowing down your accuracy to use your divination magics 
uh, so that you can really hit those impossible shots. And then, of course, you've got to bring in that uh, hex uh, shooter, gunslinger, um, fast trigger or response. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, sort of pulling on uh, trickster uh, gunslingers uh, and then f- imbuing that with a magical element. Yeah. Um, and get, and um, given, that, given that, I also saw that you have a... Stat, a stat block for a for a CR one um, gun mage, is that, is yes. that going to be it? One are the are these sort of sa- sample stat blocks going to be a th- a thing for each of the subclasses that you put in, and are are you going to be doing it at multiple tiers? Yes, uh, one of the things that when I'm reading through, um, so <laughs> obviously I read a lot of other people's homebrew. Uh, partly to research uh, other ways of doing interesting things and partly because I've made friends here and I enjoy their work. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that I'm always a little like disappointed with is, as a forever GM, I there's lots of um, interesting creative space uh, that um, comes out of player character options. And yet I really don't have time to be building a whole like, PC every time I have an interesting NPC that's going to show up for 20, 20 minutes, an hour and a half, one session. Um, so the exemplar NPC stat blocks are things that I've looked for for subclasses for a long time. So yeah, I want uh, I have made for each of the five subclasses in this packet um, right now a CR1 um, uh, creature or a CR1 NPC stat block and a CR2 um, It'll probably end up being about three. So that's a tier one, um, an NPC for tier one play and for tier two play. And then through the campaign, I've offered uh, specific rewards uh, for people to build player characters of their own. And then I'll translate those into stat blocks uh, and uh, character descriptions uh, for higher tier um, NPCs to show up. Uh, that way, if you're like, hey, yeah, uh, I've got an NPC, or I've got a player character who's a gun mage, and they've put in their backstory that they have a rival or a mentor or um, a nemesis, uh, that I can quickly pull up a, uh, a stat block that's appropriate for that uh, tier of play. Uh, and then after that, I can uh, manipulate it uh, a little bit to match the particulars of the environment. Uh, but I don't have to go through the process of building a whole player character for a temporary NPC. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that, with that said, that brings me to the other major one, the Oath of the Harvest, and I do find it interesting that for this kind of motif, you decided to have it be a paladin subclass. What made, what made you pick that one in particular? Sure, yeah. Um, part of it was um, just the idea of somebody in heavy armor sitting down and doing gardening. Um, but the paladin, like, you often find uh, a character archetype, which is uh, the country boy or the um, local hero um, warrior who's, like, doing good for their community. Um, and part of that, I'm like... Yeah, that's a sort of gardener aesthetic, um, which I think pairs really well into a paladin who is there to help and protect and serve uh, a small uh, community. Um, And for most communities throughout history uh, in our world, uh, the biggest danger for a small community was not a dragon, was not a manticore, was not a... um, necromancer their biggest concerns were always things like are we going to have enough food for the winter um will we have enough fire to keep us warm will there be enough hours in the day to do all of the labor that needs to be done uh so the oath of the harvest paladin was very much being like okay what would a paladin for a peasantry for a common person be like um and gardner paladin came up on that sort of aesthetic um 
inevitably, as I'm working on this design, I have, um, in the words of George uh, Martin, winter is coming. And that's sort of like, we must work, we must labor to be prepared for the long winters, but at the same time, to still celebrate the harvest, to uh, dance under the light of a full uh, harvest moon, um, and to be involved with your community and uh, sharing meals uh, with them so that you can all be um, joined together uh, for the hardships that will come uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of play style for the Oath of the Harvest Paladin of like, um, mitigating pieces of uh, exhaustion so that you can keep working, of um, resistance to cold damage um, and death because uh, winter is a season of death, and then just like moments of extreme effort. Uh, so having that effort pay off with uh, manipulating uh, advantages or critical ranges uh, so that your earnest effort uh, pays dividends. Mm hmm. Yeah, I could. I could see. I could see that. Now, with, I just I find it interesting because I could easily see someone arguing that this that the nature relationship would be more of a druid thing, but druids aren't very good. Aren't are unless they're wild shaped. Aren't very able to take a hit. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. And grant, granted, the whole, granted the whole being able to wild shape while casting has been a bit a bit of a problem that dips into other people's toes, but that's one of those things we're not supposed to think about. <laughs> mm -hmm, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm only saying this that far because my because my check hasn't cleared yet. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, druids druids have that nature check, but um, they serve the community in ways that aren't. Uh, putting their body on the line. Well, uh, whereas... That and a lot of um, druids in fiction aren't exactly communal. <laughs> yeah, they'll serve a community, but there'll be the, the weirdo off on the distance of like, oh yeah, y you got a problem. Solve it other ways, but like, if you really need a weird solution, there's uh, Brynhilda off in the hills, and she knows things. Yeah. Now... I do see that you're adding new spells with the, with this book. With that in mind, when it comes to the spells you are adding, are they? Is it going to be a case where each of the core spellcasting classes is getting some new spell that they can take advantage of? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that in the end, uh, each class is going to have um, at least one spell out of the group. Uh, that will fit with them. I'm also trying to pick spells that are roughly thematic with the five subclasses that are associated uh, with the book. Uh, so like for the Oath of the Harvest, we're bringing in a... Um, let's see, that's Ferric Ward, right? Let me pull that up. Uh... I have made so much stuff that sometimes I forget what all is in there. Um. Mm -hmm. Oh no, mass warden, mass warding bond, which is again pulling on that sort of like communal effort of like, if we're gonna get through this, we're all gonna get together. Plus. Warding Bond is just such a cool spell that you're like, why can't I do this with multiple people? Uh, so Math's Warding Bond is a fourth level abjuration spell that lets you share the love. Um, and then the other spell that's in the sample document, Geiger's Sickening Gaze, uh, is a ranged spell attack to uh, take advantage uh, and sort of demonstrate the um, capabilities of the gun mage who can extend the distance of that uh, beam of radiance. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other, the other subclasses will have, or I will choose spells uh, from, <laughs> I have made far too many spells, but I, other spells have been picked that uh, roughly align with the thematics of um, those spells in case you want to award these sorts of things as um, minor boons 
which I have been known to do of like, yeah. yeah, you get a minor boon. Once per long rest, you can cast this spell. Um, and those are fun sort of esoteric rewards to hand out for um, uh, quests. Mm -hmm. Now, there's three others that you brought up on the Kickstarter that weren't in the preview that I, I do want to touch upon. The oh, yes. first of these is the Way of the Displaced. I know you brought up Tracer from Overwatch, but what what exactly would be the playstyle that that's leading it, that that's leading <laughs> into, and more importantly, which I believe that's using uh, Monk given the naming conventions. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Way of the Displaced is actually a version of one of the earliest pieces of homebrew that I ever did, um, which is again going back to my sort of like tangential connection to um, video games. I've always been fascinated in watching people play um overwatch i <laughs> no interest in playing it myself but um looking at tracer and being like that's a fun play style of uh, teleporting around of undoing things of manipulating time and space um and wondering like okay how would i do something like that in a tabletop game in uh dungeons and dragons uh, 5e uh, and one of the things that i realized a long time ago having played my first like two or three characters that I played in 5e were all monks. Uh, and I've realized that monk is the superhero class of uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, because it's, it's got the, you can make huge leaps. Uh, you can um, catch bullets. Uh, you can ex run faster, move harder, uh, hit more times. Um, and it has an, the, a, resource um rhythm that is much more akin i think uh to a superhero who dishes out as much as they can and then needs to take a short break uh so the way of displace of uh the way of the displaced is a sort of like evolution of that sort of how would i make tracer as a D, &D character um and sort of filing off the uh the tracer elements and leaving behind the sort of like mystical monk who's been um, removed from time and space. Um, it is funny to see the um, developments into the 2024 version of um, the monk because a similar sort of, uh, you can do a deflect uh, blows for melee attacks mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, to increase your AC and then teleport away from an attack. Um, a higher level feature is to roll back your time. Uh, so at the end of the turn, you, uh, you can activate this uh, ability called the illusion of then, uh, to return to where you started your turn and you regain any hit points and, uh, class resources that you lost through the turn, uh, which yes, encourages you to go all out, um, with spending your key points cause you'll regain them. Uh, but also to do dumb things like jumping off of a cliff uh, and um, that you would not normally be able to uh, survive uh, and then returning to where you started from at all. Um, it's also a way to do a sort of like uh, time loop um, ability without having to track a whole round worth of things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's capstone feature is just you're constantly under the effects of the blink spell. Uh, so you are not going to be in one place for any, uh, for a long amount of time. Um, monks are in need of uh, 5e monks, at least, uh, are in need of, uh, quite a bit of power in their, uh, subclasses. So these are some features that would probably not fit into many other, uh, classes. Uh, so monk is a great place, uh, to put these sort of like unique high, higher power features. Yeah, that ma that makes sense. Now, the next one of the next one of those would be the Path of the Wrathful Spectre. And I I know you brought up um I know I know you brought up Danny Phantom in that, but but, but um one that I ended up that ended up conjuring in my head when I was going through and, and look and looking at what you're doing is um Raziel in the Legacy of Cain games. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, just... A scary, angry ghost is like... <laughs> um, 
the, the, the checklist of like, okay, what powers uh, should this have uh, were me going through the Danny Phantom, uh, walk through walls, disappear, and fly. Uh, but I think just being an angry ghost is um, a cool thing that there are lots of like different touchstones that you can draw on. Yeah. That's the um, big one because, well, if you want you want an angry ghost, well, there you go. Raziel's a wraith. You can't yep. can't get mm-hmm. much more on the nose than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also just think like the idea of being a ghost barbarian like lends itself to coming up with interesting character ideas. Like, are you dead? Are you possessed by a ghost? Were you dead once and are not there anymore? Or is this like some cultural element of your tribe? where you're um, channeling uh, your ancestors um, or are you, you could, from a tribe that like transits the uh, ethereal plane? Or you could be what's known in voodoo as a rider or a cheval. Yeah. Not to, me- not to mention, and this is, there's one aspect with barbarians that, or with berserkers that is underutilized in my opinion. Now, yes, Berserker means bare shirt. And <laughs> mm-hmm. that could either be wearing 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 bare skins or, wear, or wearing nothing at all because Berserkers were going into battlefield high as balls. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But there's, there's been the implication in some forms of, of Berserker that they are possessed by an animal spirit, like a, mm-hmm. bear, like a bear or a wolf. I think the only time this was ever really utilized in core D&D was in the edition I'm told I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because nobody can keep up on the payments. <laughs> I'm, of, I'm, of course, referring to you 4th edition. The mm-hmm. rages were daily powers that had a stance-like effect where you were essentially channeling a primal spirit. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, 5th edition comes around and... It's back to man too angry to die. <laughs> but I could, based on what how you're describing it, I could see that I could see the concept uh, of so, of someone letting themselves be possessed for this kind of effect. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, let me give you uh, it's uh, one of its third level uh, features, uh, which allows you to. Um, uh, release a, sc- a loud scream, a, gu- a ghastly wail that frightens uh, creatures around you. Uh, and then as long as other creatures are frightened of you, your rage persists. So you're standing there uh, using, feeding off of their fear to um, uh, embolden uh, that spirit inside you uh, to pers- uh, to continue your rage. Oh, that's um, a, that's which a I think is a... To, that's a good way to have the dopamine loop. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, plus it also opens up uh, you a chance to be a more tricky barbarian. Uh, so instead of just always dealing damage, to go in and, while they're frightened, move them around, do things with your rage that aren't just uh, pure damage. Which I think is a... A prankster barbarian, I think, is a really cool concept uh, for a challenge uh, for a player mm-hmm. I could I could certainly see it now that brings me to the splinter which d- which um I don't think you wrote in a touchstone for the splinter in the, in the text that you put up on the kickstarter mm-hmm. so what would um, be the touchstones of a, of a splinter a rogue who's split their mind in half and be, and have gained psychic abilities. Uh so that one's a little bit harder because where uh, where the cl- uh subclass originated uh was building a bespoke subclass for a player who was like I want to play Blake from uh Ruby. Um and then building something off of that and being like okay there's interesting ideas here and then uh developing them further. There's of course the the problematic but eternal uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, but also like looking into some of the um, uh, some of the discussions of plural identities and uh, tulpas um, and um, 
let me uh, let me throw looking... one name at let me throw one name at you to to sure. use as a potential touchstone. Luthor Harkon. Hmm. The yeah yeah of from from Warhammer Fantasy a mm -hmm. the the dre the dreaded pirate captain slash arch commander slash whatever he's calling himself this week of <laughs> the of the of the vampire coast. And a man who is completely and utterly shitting bats insane. Not bat shit insane, <laughs> shitting bats insane. In, fa in yeah. fact, in the in the war game, one of the core rules that he has is, and in fact, this is also in Total War, he is constantly shifting between, between different personalities. And if occasionally he appears to be in a stupor because his personalities are arguing with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely some of that. That would be something you could totally bring up here. That This would be a cool uh, dip uh, to pull up that sort of aesthetic. Mm -hmm. uh, but also more than uh, just like uh, people who have had a mental break um, and like developed these uh, personalities as coping me mechanisms, but people um, who have uh, this sort of a more harmonious relationship uh, with their various fractures of selves um, on a purely philosophical level. Um, there was a, a CGP Grey video many years ago uh, by the title of You Are Not You, You Are Two, uh, which sort of looks at one description of consciousness as being a um, split between an acting self and an explaining self. Um, and that's stuck around in my head as sort of an interesting idea of like a single personality or a single person is built up of smaller pieces of consciousness and looking at that and going like, okay, so we know that psionics is a thing um, oftentimes within all the worlds that we play in for uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And then there are people like scions or... Um, uh, a soul knife uh, monks or uh, psi warrior um, uh, fighters. And then like wondering, okay, what are other interesting ways that uh, the mental experience of life uh, can sort of make the internal experience of what, of uh, one's personhood external and looking at that being like, okay, yeah. What if, what if that sort of like split uh, that people might have in themselves can develop um, more using that sort of psych psionic energy into a more developed personality and uh, maybe even uh, briefly manifest it. Uh, so in some ways, the splinter is a little bit of a counterpart to um, the Echo Knight uh, that you'll find in Wayfinder's, uh, Wayfinder's Guide to... Um, Oh god, the critical role book. Suddenly the name escapes me. Which one? Alexandria. There's been, which one? There's been, yeah. like, there's uh, been like three at this point. Yeah, uh, the the Echo Knight that you'll find in Wayfire, uh, Wayfinder's Guide to Exandria. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, like, what would a rogue version of that uh, be like? That's kind of like what the Splinter is. Um, where you have this temporary uh, partner existence uh, that when it's not in its... Um, uh, physical psionic shell is still in the back of your mind uh, watching out for you hmm. or arguing with you as because that's another fun uh, sort of uh, role play um, touchstone to be like okay I'm going to be always conversing with myself and I can have these two very um, different personalities that are discussing things and we come to uh, decisions and uh, a an opportunity for the player to um <laughs> play with multiple character voices in the same way that a DM is constantly talking to themselves in multiple voices. Mm -hmm. That is def that is definitely something that can be done. Uh, now, and I'm I'm guessing with each of these each of these entries, you ha you've showcased what you ha what you refer to as exemplar NPCs, and I I believe the plan is to have one that's low level, one that's mid level, and one that's high level. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal is to be able to have one uh, for every tier of play. Um, <laughs> tier four right now is a potential um, uh, 
stretch goal, uh, since high level ca uh, monsters are always a little bit of a pain to build. Um, but uh, that way, if, say, uh, you have a character that you'll see multiple times throughout a session, mm -hmm. uh, throughout a campaign, you can watch them grow and level up uh, alongside you, um, which was another idea that came from the a uh, similar idea to the rival uh, adventures that you'd find in the uh, call from the call of the nether deep, uh, the critical role adventure published by Watsi. Mm -hmm. um, but that's always just a fun touchstone of like, Oh yeah, there are other adventures off in this world. We're not just the paladin. We're a paladin. And then there are other paladins who have their own uh, adventures. Uh, and you get the fun experience of like maybe having that sort of like character tension of people like I like you, but also like I don't like you. Um, which are, rival um, rival characters are always so much fun to have um, in a party or in a campaign. Yeah, I could I could certainly get that. So with that with that in, with that in mind. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Um, page count uh, right now with um, out any of the stretch goals, which I'm hoping to make at some point, is probably sitting around uh, 35 uh, to 40 pages. Um, this is a, a first Kickstarter. I know that there are some some of my friends, like So Many Robots, uh, who had a, just had a fantastically successful... Uh, Kickstarter for his first uh, adventure for Songs of the Spellbound Sea. Um, and he has put together a full, like, 200-page document. Um, but he has, a, he has a fantastic team that he has uh, built for himself. Um, I'm still testing the waters uh, for this sort of stuff. So this is getting things together, proving that both I can do this, uh, making these connections, and then slowly building up to something larger. So the idea being that, like, oh, this is an easy and lightweight thing to add to your uh, shelf of uh, additions, uh, easy to throw in a uh, backpack and add to a game, um, and uh, hopefully um, easier to uh, uh, easier and cheaper to produce. Mm -hmm. Which was part of the um, part of the reasoning that led to the particular like video game manual aesthetic, where it's like okay. Um, oftentimes you'd, uh, see like a beautifully rendered, uh, full color cover. And then the insides are the, like the character art, uh, which are in uh, grayscale or black and white or pieces of line art. Uh, it could double as a coloring book if that was, um, something that was interesting to you. Um, but that's sort of a, um, artistic choice born out of limitations, which, you know, a lot of the best, uh, pieces of art are built from those limitations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Um, so with now with that in, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but <laughs> um, well, uh, the reason why the campaign is uh, taking place uh, at this point of the year and not a little bit later, which it probably should have been. Uh, is because I will be returning to grad school uh, shortly. Um, so the goal is to have pretty much everything into people's hands, um, if not before I uh, return to the uh, classroom, then shortly after I do that, uh, so that I can um, not have that hanging. I cannot be trying to do both the uh, publishing work and my coursework at the same time. Um, so... Short, fairly shortly after uh, the campaign wraps um, here at the beginning of August. Mm -hmm. So, a couple months at the, <laughs> at the longest. Yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly get that and, I, and I'll be looking forward to seeing how, the, how, this kind of thing de how this kind of thing develops. Yeah. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. And oh, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful temple. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, 
Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Cheers. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!